Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we're going to discuss toxoplasmosis, a disease caused by the organism Toxoplasma gondii. Like Cryptosporidium and Malaria, um, uh, two other apicomplexa in this small group that we'll be uh, lumping together, biologically speaking, Toxoplasmosis is found throughout the world. Wherever people occur, that's where you'll find Toxoplasma. But we can go further than that with this organism. In fact, wherever you find mammals, you will find Toxoplasma, making it one of the most ubiquitously distributed parasitic diseases or parasitic infections, depending on what happens next after you acquire the infection, in the world. Its discovery occurred simultaneously in two completely different places, and small wonder that that's the case, because as I just mentioned, almost every mammal in the world has evidence of infection with this parasite. In Europe, Nicole and his uh, co-worker, Mansu, discovered this parasite in an exotic desert-dwelling animal called the Gandhi, as you see depicted here, cute little furry things that sort of reminded one of the Tribbles in one of the Star Trek episodes. At the same time, almost to the day, a Splendor working in Brazil, in working in rabbits of all uh, animals, if you work in Brazil, the rabbit is probably the least likely animal that you'd find someone doing experiments with, but in this case, Splendor was working with rabbits and discovered this parasite also in the tissue. Uh, of the rabbit. In fact, when they looked, they found it in almost all of the tissues of both animal species. They published the results separately, and of course, when the results were compared, it was realized, of course, that this was the same organism. Here's an interesting way of looking at the world through the eyes of mamma mammalian diversity. The big map shows in coloration the zones which harbor one mammalian species up to 217 mammalian species. Then the color goes from blue to green to yellow to orange to red. Notice that South America, particularly Brazil, uh, is colored intensely red. It's the area of the world that has the most diversity of mammals. One probably would have guessed otherwise if I hadn't told you that, and you would have opted perhaps for the uh, African continent. You see, the, the mammal diversity in Africa is high, but it isn't nearly as high as it is in South America, and the reason for that is quite simple. If you look at the distribution of carnivores, you'll find the number of carnivores and the kinds of carnivores very high in Africa, particularly in East Africa. And that limits the numbers and species of their prey, which turns out to be lots of hoofed animals in Africa, of course. Nonetheless, in both situations, you find a high density of infection with toxoplasma. Because in most cases, toxoplasma is transmitted from animal to animal by carnivorism. Now, there's one exception, and that's the felidae, or the cat species. The large cats and small cats, domestic cats, wild cats throughout the world, those are definitive hosts for this parasite, and they harbor the sexual stages. And that means that they can acquire this infection in several different ways. Carnivorism for sure, but also by becoming infected with their own um, stage, which they produce within their gut tract that passes out, rests. Well, why don't I just get to the life cycle? It's complicated. Of course it is. It's an apicomplexin. What else? So let's talk about the infection in humans, and then we'll diversify the conversation into what happens in the cat as well. Humans acquire the infection either by ingesting from another mammal other than a cat the pseudocyst stage, shown here, filled with organisms which have an unusual term, they're called bradyzoites. Each one is capable of developing into a separate organism after being swallowed, entering the small intestine. The bradyzoites are released, and upon being released, they transform into the stage that's infectious for most of the cells of humans. It's called the tachyzoite stage. The tachyzoite stage, 
is an obligate intracellular parasite, <clears throat> as are the bradyzoites as well. And the tachyzoite then penetrates a columnar cell, infects, reproduces, and in doing so, elicits an inflammation at the site of infection, which attracts macrophages and other phagocytic cells, much to the demise of those cells because, um, like Leishmania, which attracts cells to it by inducing an inflammation, when toxoplasma does the same thing, it's actually attracting more host cells for it to infect. And in fact, it does infect um, macrophages uh, and dendritic cells uh, and other cell types uh, that are, are uh, common for processing antigen. And uh, the only cells that we think it doesn't attack routinely are the T cells. <clears throat> the replication cycle is rather simple. It undergoes uh, division and cell death, and division and cell death, and division and cell death, and division. And it just keeps on going like this for a long time until the host immune response catches on to what's going on and starts to respond to a variety of antigens produced by the parasite. Most of the immunity that's engendered against this infection within the infected host is Th1 dependent. It is a interferon type based immunity. But antibodies are also produced and they play a big role in preventing, in this case, the infection of the fetus in a pregnant woman. The antibodies form a barrier and prevent the organism from actually crossing into the placenta and then into the uh, fetus itself. The mechanism through which that occurs is not well understood because obviously this is still an intracellular parasite. So how do antibodies uh, interfere with that process when the organisms themselves are inside of a cell? It's trying to get across the placental barrier. But nonetheless, the, the correlation of antibody with uh, protection of the fetus in an infected mother is uh, quite striking and, and, and quite uh, assured. In a human infection, that's an adult-acquired infection for the first time, <clears throat> then pathologies can occur with regards to the attack of various tissues by these tachyzoites. There can be retinal damage. We can develop lesions in the brain. It attacks the lymphatic system, and we get enlargement of lymph nodes. And it can induce uh, hepatitis-like syndrome in the liver by killing off parenchymal cells. As I mentioned, this organism knows no bounds in terms of infection uh, with regards to the cell type. So uh, this makes it one of the most ubiquitous parasites that we can think of. Now, if we were to continue this discussion, which we will do, into the cat, we see a completely different picture. In the cat, let's assume this cat has never been exposed to toxoplasmosis before. It acquires the infection from an infected rodent. The rodent harbors the pseudocyst in its tissues. Cats are rather non-picky when it comes to selecting portions of mouse. Uh, it doesn't require anything else but the mouse itself, and it consumes usually the entire carcass if it's um, a hunter a cat species. And there are many, many different cat species out there. Uh, domestic cats sometimes are reluctant to capture mice and to kill them and then to eat them. Uh, a lot of times they're so unfamiliar with mice that they will play with them as if they're just another species in the house. But in general, cats will attack and kill rodents. And in doing so, by acquiring, uh, by eating the tissues, they acquire the infection. But then the cycle differs a great deal from that of all the other mammal species in that the organism undergoes a sexual stage of reproduction, very similar in shape and form, although now deeply intracellular, as we demonstrated with cryptosporidium. The terms are a little bit different because obviously the apicomplexa differ a little bit from species to species. But nonetheless, the results are the same. You get production of male and female sex, pre-sex cells. These sporozoite-like organisms can then fertilize, in quotes, the female uh, merant. And then after that, it becomes a zygote. The zygote forms uh, an oocyst. The oocyst then ruptures out into the gut tract of the, of the, the cat, in this case. And when it exits, 
from the cat, it sporulates, and it produces two organisms uh, of, of uh, equal size inside the oocyst. The organism at this point is now back to haploid. The cat can actually become infected by consuming a portion of its own fecal droppings, and by ingesting oocysts, it can become reinfected without ever having to uh, eat another mouse. Immunity does develop in the cat as well as in the human, or in any other mammal species for that matter, uh, and we'll get to that. But just know that uh, once the cat has been infected once, it can become infected again and again and again because the immunity that, in, that is engendered by exposure to the entire infection is not totally protection to protective against the next uh, wave of infection. Here's a good um, snapshot <laughs> of the way a house cat and a mouse might interact together if one were to find them romping about your front room as you come home late night from a, a, a movie or something of this sort or dinner. Uh, you had your dinner and now the cat is about to have its dinner. What you ate for dinner might have been something that looked like this, a rack of lamb or a rare steak. Uh, that's the way we usually inquire the infection. So by ordering our meals rare or medium rare, uh, in this case, a rack of lamb, but of course, a lot of us like our steaks well, not well done. Uh, you order a hamburger, medium rare. You're running a risk at that point of acquiring toxoplasmosis. And that's why it's such a ubiquitously distributed infection in humans. Uh, some statistics will serve to point that up. For instance, in France, uh, by the time you reach the age of 20, about 80% of the population has some evidence of being infected with Toxoplasma condi. And that's true for a lot of other countries as well. Here's a very interesting shot of a macrophage in culture that was obviously attacking and trying to destroy the tachyzoites that were placed in culture with it. And instead, of course, it became infected and eventually it was killed. So in this case, the hunter becomes the hunted. Now, how does that work? Well, there's a very sophisticated molecular biology associated with toxoplasma intracellular infection. And shown in this electron micrograph is the essence of that sophistication. You've got tachyzoites illustrated with T's here, here, and here. Here's some more unlabeled ones. And what has been done in this case is that the macrophage was first fed thoratrast, which lights up all of the lysosomes. And you can see a lysosome here. There's another one here. This is probably one over here as well, one in this area here. So these little dots represent the thoratrast material. And what they're trying to show in this electromicrograph is that when a macrophage becomes infected with living tachyzoites, the tachyzoite has the ability to prevent the fusion of lysosomes with the parasitophorus vacuole, which is shown here. Now, how do we know that's true? Well, the other experiment demonstrates that amply. If one were to induce, instead of living tachyzoites, if one were to heat kill these tachyzoites first, and then introduce them to the macrophages, not only would the macrophages take them up, but they would be able to fuse their lysosomes with the parasitophorus vacuole, in this case, a dead organism is it inside, <clears throat> and the, um, the enzymes contained within the lysosome, of course, um, creates an acidification event followed by the release of various proteases, uh, DNAase, uh, lots of other ACEs, uh, the enzyme systems in lysosomes are quite extensive, resulting in the complete dissolution of this organism eventually. So living organisms prevent this process and dead organisms can't prevent this process. And that's the basis for the maintenance of this infection in various cell types. Here's an example of an unsporulated and a sporulated oocyst, as you might expect to see in cat feces. Now, Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating further the pathogenesis of this infection. This is a 28-year-old man who presented with headache for two weeks. He has low-grade fever, and he has some change from baseline in his mental status and weakness in his left arm. He was brought into the emergency room at a hospital on Long Island after his friend noticed that he fell to the floor 
and had shaking motor activity. The patient was confused after this event and was brought to the hospital by ambulance by the emergency medical service. The history is mostly obtained from this male friend roommate, the man who brought him in. The roommate reports um, some alcohol and some recreational use by the patient, uh, reports only local travel in the area, uh, and the patient is reported to be very sexually active with multiple partners of both sexes. On exam, he's initially confused but following commands and reported not at a normal state by his friend. Um, the patient is a thin man who is noted to have a white coating on the tongue and buccal mucosa, and that's the inside of the cheeks. An HIV test comes back positive. The viral load is greater than 100,000. The CD4 count is 25, and the toxoplasma IgG is positive. CT of the brain, as well as MRI, show multiple ring-enhancing lesions with surrounding edema. Now let's talk about clinical disease. There are three main presentations of uh, toxoplasmosis. There's congenital, there's disease in the immunocompetent host, and there's disease in the immunocompromised host. Now congenital toxoplasmosis. Congenital infection varies from asymptomatic to severe damage to the central nervous system and stillbirth. Uh, transmission typically occurs when a pregnant woman acquires the infection during the pregnancy. And transmission to the fetus is lowest when the infection occurs during the first trimester, but the severity of disease is the worst. The percentage of transmission rises with gestational age to over 70%, but the severity of the consequences um, to the fetus are decreased. So earlier infection, lower risk of transmission, higher risk of severe disease. Later in pregnancy, when acute disease is acquired, um, we're gonna see um, more transmission, but we're gonna see less severe disease. And the fetal damage is most severe and likely when the infection occurs early in the pregnancy. Now the classic triad of chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus, and intracranial calcifications is present in less than 10% of cases. Congenital toxoplasmosis can present as a subclinical infection or a severe neonatal disease and really anywhere in between. Um, disease is often noted in the first few months of life or later can present as a relapse. Of the infants that do acquire infection in utero, about 15% will have severe clinical manifestations. And what are these? Now, chorioretinitis, um, this is involvement of the certain parts of the eye. This can lead to blindness. Uh, the child may develop cerebral calcifications uh, there may be learning disabilities. Uh, these are really the most frequent, but um, severely affected infants can also have issues with hepatosplenomegaly, so enlargement of the liver and the spleen, liver failure, thrombocytopenia, which is low platelets, convulsions, so seizure activity, and um, hydrocephalus. Now, without treatment, new lesions can continue to develop, and you can um, increase the likelihood of severe impairment to the CNS. And here's an unfortunate um, young child, a uh, victim of congenital toxoplasmosis. These are some changes that we're seeing on plain radiographs, um, some of the calcifications that we're seeing. Um, this is actually a postmortem. This is a brain from a, um, a child who died. Um, this child had congenital toxoplasmosis. And this is just giving us a sense over time of um, congenital toxoplasmosis following maternal infection that occurred during the first or second trimester. And so um, we have 6% lumped together that are developing severe infection. Um, but then, as, as mentioned, the majority will not end up um, acquiring infection. Now, once you move to third trimester, the, um, the risk increases, but the severity of the manifestation decreases. Now let's move on to disease in the immunocompetent host. And th this is quite common. 80 to 90% of acquired infections are asymptomatic. Um, those that are clinically apparent usually present as a mild self-limited disease. Symptomatic acute toxoplasmosis in the immunocompetent individual is often lumped in as a mono-like illness. It's characterized by generalized um, enlargement of the lymph nodes, lymphadenopathy, um, particularly in uh, impacting the cervical nodes, sometimes associated with a low-grade fever. 
um, somewhat similar to mono. Now, rarely the adult acquired toxoplasmosis can be more severe, maybe an advantage to acquiring it younger in life. And when the adult acquired is severe, it can involve many of the major organs, particularly the heart presenting with myocarditis and encephalitis infecting the brain. Now, chorioretinitis, as we described in the newborn, is really rare in acquired adult toxoplasmosis. But despite that, the fact that this is such an ubiquitous organism, T. gondii is still one of the most common pathogens to cause posterior uveitis in immunocompetent hosts. Now, this is a nice little differential um, that the um, person presenting with uh, lymph adenopathy or enlarged nodes um, might sort of be brought through in the thinking. Um, if it's pretty significant, toxoplasmosis or lymphoma. Mono, though you have enlarged lymph nodes, they tend not to be quite as prominent as we see in toxoplasmosis. Pharyngitis is more significant with mono than we see with toxo. Um, and then, as you can see going down, there's a number of features that allow um, the distinction to be suggested, um, and then later specific testing can help uh, with the differential. Now, what about the immunocompromised host? Now, as our patient presents, encephalitis due to T. gondii is one of the major causes of CNS disease in patients with AIDS. Um, toxoplasmosis in this setting is almost uniformly due to reactivation of the, of the disease acquired previously. But which HIV-infected patients are at the most risk? These are really patients that have significantly decreased CD4 T cell count, so less than 100. Um, <clears throat> and coupling this with a positive serological test helps in the diagnosis. Now, the brain imaging usually reveals multiple ring-enhancing lesions, um, but there also could be extracerebral manifestations of toxo in the immunocompromised patient. But in general, um, we think of it as a CNS-focused disease in the immunocompromised host. This shows you just a little bit of pathology as well as um, CT scan changes. Now, what about toxoplasma ocular disease? Um, as mentioned, this is usually from congenital infection. Um, later, we might see it as um, adults. And as um, with episodic flares, you may end up destroying retinal tissue and specific therapy is necessary. If not, you can have progression of this disease. And this is just showing some uh, images of some of the changes that one can see um, with toxoplasmosis. Now, another way that one might become infected, um, in addition to all the ways that Dixon has um, discussed previously, is infection through blood or organ transplant. And how is this gonna present? Uh, this is gonna present with um, parasitemia in the, one, in the white blood cells for up to a year post-infection. Here we can see heart, bone marrow, liver, kidney donors um, being able to give this to a toxo-negative donor. Um, this often presents with a myocarditis and again with this diffuse swelling of the lymph node, so a diffuse lymph adenopathy. This is showing a pseudocyst in the heart. Here we see a pseudocyst in the liver. These are pseudocysts in microglial, in a microglial nodule. Um, this is um, a variant that we might see in the HIV AIDS patient with the CD4 count below 100. Now, what about diagnosis? Now, di definitive diagnosis is made by demonstrating the organism in histological sections or by using um, PCR. Now, as you can imagine, we're talking about a disease that often manifests, manifests in, um, in the brain. So these are going to be slightly challenging. Now, PCR tests are especially useful in identifying organisms in, in the fluid, so in the ocular, the amniotic, or the CSF fluids, allowing us not to necessarily have to do a biopsy. Specifically, immunoglobulins, um, IgG and IgM. Now, there's a wide variety of laboratory-based um, methods looking at these, and we're going to see IgM antibodies appearing early, right? In the first five to two weeks is a general rule with this and uh, most infections. Um, the IgG antibodies are going to take two to three weeks to become positive. Now, in most cases, we're looking at reactivation. So we're going to see that um, the IgG antibodies are positive when a, when a person is presenting. Now, we have a little more challenge when we're trying to look at the, um, the fetal exposure.
Now in AIDS, um, often what we're doing is a presumptive diagnosis with treatment of toxoplasmosis. So we're looking at a triad, so a, a clinic, compatible clinical syndrome, a positive um, toxoplasma IgG, um, typical brain imaging, uh, demonstrating multiple ring enhancing lesions. Now in this context, we're positive predictive value is, is greater than 90%. And we'll often go ahead, again, with the C4 count less than 100, and institute a therapeutic trial looking for a response to treatment. Now these are, as we mentioned, the timing um, from exposure. We have an early surge of IgM followed by IgG. And most of our cases we're gonna see in here, particularly in the HIV adults. Um, here is direct immunofluorescent antibody beautiful image. Um, but what about treatment? And I, and I want to say there are alternatives. This has come up in the press periodically when there are issues with shortages of different drugs. <clears throat> but it, it's a combination therapy. Uh, we'll often, as our primary drugs, use a pyrimethamine um, and then a sulfadiazine with a leucovore and rescue. Um, but if pyrimethamine is unavailable, we'll often use Bactrim, TMP sulfa. Um, now, pregnancy is a challenge. Um, it's unclear actually what the best approach is during uh, pregnancy. So I don't want to make any um, sort of recommendations here that I, I think, if anything, um, spiromycin, spiromycin has been used during the first trimester, but it's unclear what the best approach is. So I'm going to just leave people to realize that this is something to think about, something that we're actively studying. Now, what about our patient? Now, our patient with the low CD4 count, clinical picture and positive toxoplasmosis serology um, was put on empiric treatment. So he's put on anti-toxoplasmosis therapy with sulfadiazine and pyrimethamine. Um, we didn't see any midline shifts, so no steroids initially. Um, with the seizure, he was started on anti-seizure um, therapy and we had neurology involved for follow-up. Two weeks into therapy, we repeated the CT, which showed improvement. His cognitive status improved and uh, antiretroviral therapy was started at that point. The patient continued to um, improve and he did well. Uh, there's uh, been a lot of uh, recent literature with regards to the effects of toxoplasma on the behavior of organisms, particularly mice, with regards to their ability to perceive the presence or absence of cats. So what's been found is that the organism in the brain of mice that are infected um, actually interferes with the ability of the mouse to detect the urine of cats. And since cat urine is the main alarm signal that mice use to know that cats are around and active, the fact that mice are now uh, not aware of cats, but the cats are still there, means that the cats now have an advantage in order to capture them. From that result, a lot of speculation has emerged with regards to the effects of toxoplasma on humans as well. And most of it is mythology. Uh, according to John Boothroyd, um, who has appeared on our TWIP show and uh, been asked that same question as to whether or not he believes that human behavior is altered to any significant degree by uh, prior infection with toxoplasma, he believes the answer is no, unless, of course, uh, your behavior is engendered with regards to the uh, presence or absence of cat urine, which probably uh, represents a very small subset of people, uh, indeed. Although cat urine does have its uh, unique uh, odor problems, uh, as most cat owners know. Uh, if 80% of people over the age of 20 are infected with toxoplasma in France, I dare say that if abnormal behavior uh, was associated with infection in with toxoplasma, this would have been noted a long time ago. So as far as we know, uh, the only uh, relationships that it has really affected are the mouse-cat interplay ecological setting. So preventing and controlling the infection relates very much to avoiding infection. So uh, recommendations for women who become pregnant are for them not to handle their cat litter, let the husband do the, the cleaning, and stay away from that cat litter because that's where the oocysts are, if the cat is infected, of course. Now, house cats are usually not infected because they don't hunt. This is particularly true in situations like New York City. Although 
There are lots of mice that live in New York. Most of the time, the domestic cats don't play a role in that life cycle. So what other, what other ways do cats have of acquiring this infection besides eating mice? And the answer comes from a surprising source. Imagine yourself in your kitchen and you're preparing the evening meal. And let's say, for instance, that the evening meal in this case is a, um, an Italian meal involving, let's say, meatballs and spaghetti with nice red sauce, nice red wine. Sounds great, right? So how do you make meatballs? Well, a lot of recipes call for a mixture of veal and um, beef and pork. And the odds are that one of those three meat sources contains the pseudocysts of Toxoplasma gondii. Now, we don't go around picking up pieces of meat and eating them, although I, I won't say that we don't do that, but most of us don't do that. But what will happen if you own a cat? The cat, being a curious animal, jumps up on the top of the counter with the chef and, of course, is looking for a little tidbit. And how can you resist? So you're making your meatballs and you get finished and there's a little bit left in each of the packages that you bought the meat in. And you just sort of put it all together and you make little piles of it and you give it to your cat. Next thing you know, your cat is now infected with toxoplasma. So that's how a non-hunting cat can acquire this infection in a domestic situation. So you still have to recommend to women who become pregnant to avoid cleaning the cat litter because no matter what you say, the cat can acquire this infection in strange ways that you may not predict. Avoid eating raw or undercooked meats. Well, that's a very interesting recommendation, but we've become accustomed to eating them. So the fact is that toxoplasma isn't going to go away by simply recommending that. There are no meat inspections that will tell you which meats are infected and which aren't. And if they did, of course, they'd have to condemn maybe a third of the, of the slaughtered animals that come into the United States or into uh, certainly Western Europe. So this remains a problem that is ongoing. And it's a problem for wildlife, too. So one of the big problems exists out on the west coast of the United States with regards to uh, sea otters. Now, sea otters usually eat uh, abalone. But abalone has been overfished in many areas. So they've switched their diet from abalone to snails, sea snails. And on the Monterey Peninsula, where there's a lot of farming, and there's a lot of feral cats, and there's a lot of toxoplasma oocysts. What happens every time a heavy rain occurs is that there's agricultural runoff carrying not only the agricultural products of, let's say, fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides, but also the oocysts in the cat feces themselves. Where does it go? It goes into Monterey Bay. From Monterey Bay, it dissolves in the water, of course, and the cat feces becomes part of the milieu of the bay, and the oocysts begin to settle, and they are taken out of the water column by filter feeders. And many of these snail species become infected by eating things that collect these oocysts. And I'm not going to say that snails are filter feeders, but certainly abalone are. But the snails have become heavily infected as a result of the disappearance of the abalone from those areas. So instead of having a ready food source of abalone, the sea otters changed their diets and started to prey on the snails instead. And when that happened, they acquired toxoplasma and they are ill-prepared to deal with this infection and they died off in large numbers. So if you make a map of the distribution of sea otters along the western coast of North America, you will find a paucity of them in the areas that are most impacted by agricultural runoff, uh, and that's associated with feral cats, like I just said. If you want to learn more, of course, we have selected a wonderful uh, uh, recent review article, um, which contains a lot of information, and I highly recommend it. And we have a number of episodes of TWIP as listed here, including um, a really remarkable interview with John Boothroyd as well, who's recognized as one of the world's great experts on toxoplasma, for your listening pleasure. So to access that, all you have to do is go to microbe.tv slash twip, and the listening enjoyment is yours. So thanks very much for joining me this time, and I'll see you next time, when we will be discussing 
Entamoeba histolytica, the causative agent of hemibiasis. 